Next up, ladies and gentlemen, is a panel on unleashing the capabilities of blockchain. What industry will blockchain disrupt next? And what will the continuing influence of AI and automation mean to financial institutions? Moderating this session is Emily Southen, Legal Director at DLA Piper, and she's going to be joined on stage by Steve Kirst, Founder of Token, Jessica Rainier, Senior, co senior Counselor at the U.S. Department of Treasury, Zishan Firuz, CEO of UK Coinbase, and Naveen Gupta, Head of MENA and Europe at Ripple. Please give it up to our panelists. Good morning. Blockchain has been dubbed the fourth industrial revolution technology of great promise. Um, we can see that globally, it's being embraced, and also here in the region by the government and the regulators, as we've seen over the past few days. It is seen as the foundation for improving productivity and streamlining processes. And here in the UAE, the government has adopted blockchain-based initiatives and also the regulators are setting up environments to foster um, innovation and growth with blockchain-based solutions. So interesting fact, within MENA, we have 450 million people, half of which are millennials. I don't know why that surprised me, but it did. And with such a young population, I think that brings a lot of growth and attractive opportunities. Now, I'm actually very privileged to be sat here amongst these experts in their fields. And what I'm hoping is that you'll enjoy the discussions uh, and by learning from their experiences in each of their respective areas. And what I thought we could start with, it was an introduction by each of you before we go into the questions. Happy to do that, Emily. Thank you very much. I'm Naveen Gupta. I'm with Ripple. And our single mission in life is to remove friction from cross-border payments. We have hundreds of financial institutions actively in production using our platform to make cross-border uh, payments like sending an email, like we send WhatsApp between each other. You are able to send money between two regulated institutions. Hi, I'm Steve Kirsch. I'm Chief Innovation Officer for Token. And what we do is supply open banking software to banks so they can be compliant with open banking regulations. Uh, and we also supply software to developers so that they can access open banking uh, APIs from banks. And they're just, uh, they're, unfortunately, there isn't one standard. So what we do is we interface to each of the different standards and we make a single API so a developer can access uh, functions of the bank, and so we can open up uh, banking functions to applications. And more recently, uh, we started developing a, a new digital money solution that allows banks to issue fungible digital money. And this has not been possible before, and so it allows banks to do things like um, very quick electronic payments that happen 24 by 7 cross-border and eliminate a lot of the cross-border uh, problems that we have today. Hi, I'm Zishan. Uh, I work for Coinbase. We're, uh, we do a bunch of stuff. We're a crypto exchange. We've got about 30 million customers uh, today on the retail side. Uh, for retail customers on one end of the spectrum, we have apps that allow it make it, that make it easy to buy and sell crypto. And on the institutional side, we have a custody solution. We have our own stable coin as well. Um, and we have a prime exchange. So what we, what we essentially act today as a, uh, we try and make it as easy to buy and sell crypto and we act as an on and off ramp for most people into crypto. I'm Jessica Renier. I'm from the United States Department of the Treasury. Um, starting at the Treasury, I was senior advisor for domestic finance where I focused on how we leverage emerging technologies like blockchain technology 
to grow the economy, um, as well as considering the more prudential aspects of safety and soundness of the financial system. Um, now, as senior counselor for terrorist financing and financial crimes, I'm more focused on how we use emerging technologies to um, catch illicit activity or bad actors in a more effective manner and ensure that um, illicit actors are not abusing the creation of that new technology. Thank you. So I thought what we could start sharing um, is perhaps one or two opportunities that you've all come across in your respective roles in, in either the companies that you work for that you've, that you've set up or in your advisory capacity, Jessica, in terms of what the blockchain technology has brought for you in terms of opportunities. I don't know, Naveen, whether we go yeah. down or... Whatever you want, I can start. Why not, right? <laughs> so I think most of the people here in the audience are either financial institutions from the UAE or professionals who are based in the Middle East. The biggest opportunity today, what I can see in the region is, so if you look at the Silicon Valley in the US, you look at PayPal, Stripe, any of these uh, large cross-border payment firms, the reason they were born in the US is because US offered a very large market, right? It had the VC network, it had the money to fund them, and it had enabling regulation when the internet was born. And that made a huge difference to the way the US is perceived today on the fintech front versus, say, for example, GCC. Now, if you look at GCC, it has the same elements. It's actually a bigger market in terms of cross-border payments compared even to the US, right? So UAE itself is second, KSA is third, and if combined put together, GS, uh, GCC is bigger. It has got more money. In fact, it funds fintechs all over the world. Mumbadla announced a, a very large um, pool of money to be set aside uh, for, for startups. And it has enabling regulator like ADGM and central banks around the GCC network. So I would be surprised um, if we wouldn't have large global firms, fintech firms coming from GCC because this is their backyard. So Ripple, um, Finabler, which is a Ripple customer, is one such firm which has gone, uh, gone global. But I think there's a large opportunity for many of these companies to work with nimble, nimble players like us and to rule this space. And I would be surprised that if in some time this doesn't happen. Yeah. yeah. Great. Thank you. Steve. So uh, we really think there's a huge opportunity to modernize the fundamental plumbing uh, of money worldwide. You know, for example, you mentioned uh, PayPal. So I recently sold a car, and it was, it was I, don't, I have to admit, it was only $5,000 that I sold it for. Um, but that payment through PayPal took six days before I knew I got the money. So the alternative would have been to force the person to go to the bank and get a bank check and hand me a paper check. And that's preposterous for the technology that we have available for us today. Um, another example is a Libra. When Libra first announced, all the banks were in fear that all their business would go away and would go to Libra. But you know, that really shouldn't have happened. The banks really should have created the technology and adopted the, and embraced new technology so that Libra should have been a non-event. And so what our mission is to use this new technology to give banks the tools so that if they adopt it, they can join together and create an instant payment network worldwide that solves all these problems and would make Libra a non-event. And so that's, um, we first, when we first embarked on that journey, we went with the traditional, oh, the, the Bitcoin or the, you know, the shared ledger, the DLT technology, that is the, you know, that's gonna solve all the problems. And the reality was, we, and we tried that with Stellar, which is Sharia compliant uh, cryptocurrency. And we realized that it's really going to come down to the G10. I mean, we looked at the G10 central banks, and all of them were exploring and actively looking at uh, central bank digital currencies. And in fact, we engaged with the Bank of England, who challenged us to come up with uh, a solution to the problem with central bank digital currencies in terms of having people hold central bank cash. And so we devised a solution that we went around to all the regulators, and they just loved it. The central banks loved it, and the banks loved it too. Um, but in order to do that, we had to create a system that the central banks would like. And every central bank said, data sovereignty. 
the data has to rely in my, my data center, and it had to be private. And so we, we ended up abandoning the use of the traditional blockchain technology, and we went with custom uh, uh, ledgers that are shared, but there's no consensus, because money isn't about a vote of, hey, you know, I think it's about central bank, right? Because if you can't trust the central bank, who can you trust? And so we designed something that would allow people to move money with instant central bank settlement and certainty of settlement um, that provides a, a system that really moves us 20, 30 years forward from where we are today. So I agree with uh, quite a lot of what Steve said. Uh, I think um, for, from my perspective, I feel like, so we talk a lot about the, the term fintech. It got, gets banded around quite a lot. And I feel like a lot of fintech businesses are, um, they, they're built on top of existing rails. Most, um, there was TransferWise yesterday, uh, Revolut in the UK. They're all delivered, they find efficiencies in the current financial system and they deliver clear, clear value to customers. However, they are what I see them as, as surface level solutions that are built on top of an existing financial system. And what I think crypto and, and money, which is the bedrock of that financial system, is um, I think that is what crypto is disrupting. I think the, the concept of money is, is ripe for disruption, and that's what we believe. We think that really what we call money is, is about to change. And we think that there will be, we're heading towards a world where you'll have central bank backed digital currencies. Um, I think there's, there's certainly, uh, they, they're not going away. But I also think that there will be decentralized currencies and ultimately it'll become a matter of choice on where you store your wealth and value. And, and with that future in mind, with the changing face of money, we as a business are trying to see how we can accelerate um, 100 years of financial evolution in a traditional financial system in a crypto ecosystem. So what, we, what we're trying to do is build uh, solutions that cater to your average retail customer. Uh, so you can get paid in your uh, Coinbase account. You can spend using your Coinbase account. Um, you can pay your bills using your Coinbase account. Uh, as well as, you, you know, we're building tools for B2B commerce businesses. So we've got Coinbase Commerce, which is like a payment gateway. Um, and then we have our institutional offering. So we have our custody solutions. We have our prime exchange. We have OTC trading desk. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to accelerate, hopefully in maybe half a decade, uh, about 100 years of financial evolution to try and take crypto mainstream to free money from central banks and to cr turn it into an open ecosystem. And I disagree totally with that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna tell, I, I think central <laughs> banks and banking is the way to go. I don't think decentralization is the way to go. And I don't think that central bank digital currencies um, is viable. I mean, the, the premier uh, central banks, like the, the G5 central banks, have all said, hey, this is a non-starter. And Bank of England wrote a great analysis as to why that was. And when I first read it, coming from the crypto side, I said, no, no, you're wrong. But I realized that they were absolutely right in their analysis. And so what you need is something that really balances um, the CDBC versus uh, bank-issued stuff. And so we, we came up with a, a unique solution that handles both M1 and M0 currency. And that's the sort of solution that allows banks to move into the, um, uh, into the modern age. And that will make any kind of distributed currency like not interesting. When I talk to anybody who does like um, uh, capital markets, right? They said, um, and I talked to a guy who, who creates the technology for all these exchanges. And he said, hey, I won't even touch anything that's not backed by a central bank. But once you bring to me a central bank backed currency system, and I'm not talking about CDBC, um, that's when you get huge adoption. And so I'm like, I'm all in it for, you know, making banks and central banks successful. 
And that's exactly the mindset we need to change. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so I, I think what I'll do is I'll, I'll take a step yeah. back here for everyone from, from the details of that discussion more towards, I think oftentimes when we think about innovation, um, it's easy, I think, to get so excited about the possibilities of the potential new technology, which certainly there are, um, and forget the things that are simply table stakes that just have to be built into the division and into the vision and the design of the technology from day one. So as a threshold matter, um, a, any new company working with a new technology simply needs to be able to guarantee that they have addressed concerns with respect to money laundering, um, terrorist financing, um, a, ability to screen against sanctions. And those concerns um, or those table stakes, if you will, simply have to be demonstrated to regulators on day one. It's not a, you know, 180 days from day one, it is today, on the day that you launch, that has to be um, in place. And we know that, um, that illicit actors have exploited digital assets um, to the tune of billions of dollars um, to execute um, activities like drug trafficking, human trafficking, cybercrime, um, child pornography, um, things that your company simply don't want to find out that they have been asso associated with, even if inadvertently, even if unknown. Um, that's, you know, you don't want to find that out on the day that, um, you know, that regulators come in and then shut down the, uh, shut down your business. So in terms of opportunities, it's a sure way to guarantee that your business won't survive if those things are not in, in place from day, day one. So to your question in terms of opportunities, uh, more specifically, I think the industry, um, the digital asset industry has spent an enormous amount of energy and expertise um, on developing new kinds of ways to transmit value and, and payments. Um, that industry has not spent nearly enough time on taking that expertise and energy and applying it to the problems that we need to solve in illicit finance. And it absolutely has the ability, the capacity. Some of the innovators, investors, developers in the digital asset arena are some of the smartest and most capable globally. And so it, it is time for them to take that um, energy and expertise, not only ensure that it's baked into their business models from day one, but also focus on how we address some of the worst challenges, the toughest challenges that we have in illicit finance. And absent those safeguards or appropriate safeguards to ensure that we aren't um, laundering money or supporting sanctions evasion, the U.S. will work with its partners and governments around the world to ensure that non-compliant companies um, do not survive. Yeah. And following Jess's line of, so let me just take a very different view, a consumer view, right? So what everybody here in the room as individuals, what are you looking for? So let's just talk about a couple of use cases which we find very, very effective, right? So let's assume you're, you're subscriber to FT.com. Today, you only have one choice. That means you pay $69 and you become a subscriber and you get the newspaper free every month. But idly, that's what I think. This is FT.com is a hypothetical example. What it would like to do is, let's assume it already has X million subscriber and it's reaching a saturation point. It wants to give you a right to read just one article at 10 cents, right? So Emily pays 10 cents and she should be able to read an article from our favorite journalist on a favorite topic. But there is no payment system in the world today which can accept 10 cents from Emily and pay it to FT.com. Nobody can do this, right? At a reasonable price, at, in a quick fashion, so that she presses one button on the other side, she's able to read that article. But cryptos can do it, right? At an almost negligible cost, they're able to let Emily read that article. So micropayments is one such area where very large number of publishers are looking for a venue to go to hundreds of millions of customers like Emily and get them on board where they're able to serve bite-sized content. And hence, we created, for example, Coil. Another good example here would be, I don't know how many of you play video games. Yeah, perfect, right? By the way, my son is 13. He plays video games. So if you want to hang out with him, he will ask you, he'll give you his pseudo name on the video game and then you join that. Nobody turns up on his door. And he wins virtual swords. He will win different things. But what he wants to do is convert his virtual sword into an ice cream. 
right? Because he wants to sell his virtual sword for a dollar to somebody else who wants it, who wants to slay or get to the next level and convert that into ice cream. There is no payment system in the world that lets him do that. Though he has won something of value, the video game and in the social media, everybody tells your sword is valuable, but what he needs is an ice cream, right? So what we are able to do is take that digital asset from him, it's got some value, which somebody else needs, and through XRP, convert that into an, X, through an ice cream, which he can give at a shop in the fiat currency, and then go ahead and do it. So these are huge markets in waiting with hundreds and millions of customers where the pent-up demand is there, but we are failing them because there is no micropayment system. And at Ripple, we are changing that through our investment in companies, through working uh, in, in the ecosystem, and helping them to, to enable their businesses. And this is an idea whose time has come. Thank you, it's very interesting. So um, I might join my son at home and convert some more swords into ice cream for myself. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, but, but you don't need crypto no. to do it. <laughs> you can do it with standard fiat currencies using these new technologies. So don't buy the myth. <laughs> <laughs> and I think perhaps after this panel, we should have a race with you, Steve and Ishan, to see who gets there first. In terms yeah, there'll be, you know, we should have a session that we can services. go one on one. I'd love to. <laughs> That's been very interesting. But in on the flip side of that, with your journeys to date, and we've, we've sent some friction and different opinions, which we love actually, because there is no one size fits all with any of this. What are some of the challenges that you've come across or, or had to deal with that? Ideally, we wish there never was. And how could we maybe think about ways of mitigating against those as new joiners in this industry? Um, I can start, or Steve, you want to start? Yeah, I could. Sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, I think that, um, so we're, we're pioneering new technology. And we realized pretty early on that if we went into a regulator and said, well, it's this thing, and you know, it was really complex to understand, that that would just be a non-starter. So we ended up doing, our, our big idea was basically to take the way the banking system works today and just make it a lot more efficient. So instead of, in the US dollar, for example, there are 10,000 banks all over the place and they all run different systems. And of course, you know, that's just a microcosm of the whole world. And so we said, hey, look, let's just take the way banking works. And banking is hierarchical relationships, right? There's the European Central Bank, there are the national central banks, there are banks, there are Nostro accounts, there are Nostros under Nostros and Nostros under Nostros. And let's just take that and we can put that into a new structure called a hierarchical shared ledger. And we can compress all of these 10,000 systems down into a single computer that has the ledgers for all the banks. The regulator would have complete visibility and control over that, and so you'd get central bank certainty for all of the transactions. But the way that it operates is exactly the same as it operates now. And so I don't have to go and do you know, charts and ex explain complicated things. I say, hey, this is just business as usual. We just upgraded the underlying technology and we can put everything on a chip. And that actually works really, really well because all the sanction screening, all of the compliance issues, the AML works exactly like it does today. And so, but even with that, even with the story that people could understand, you still have the adoption problem. And so you st you're coming in with a new technology and it's like, hey, I just invented the payment card or I just invented the internet. Well, there's no one else on the internet, so why should we do it? I mean, it took banks 10 years to get on the internet. And that's a, like a no-brainer today. Like if, if you're a bank and you're not on the internet, you're nowhere. But you know, when you look back at the history, it took 10 years for, for the first bank to sort of the last bank to get on the internet. And so anytime you have these new technologies, even though you're doing this, the same thing in a different way, um, that you have this adoption problem. And so it's absolutely awesome to be able to go to AG, ADGM and to meet with regulators who are really state of the art. And in fact, you know, I learned last night that, there are, that they took people from the Bank of England, from FCA, from MAS, who were frustrated with the pace of regulation and how it's done. Things would take two years that they can do an ADGM in two months and actually do it better. And so having a regulator which is open to new ideas, and they see like 400 um, ideas come to them uh, a year, to be able to go to a regulator and describe your, your problem and in five minutes, 
he says, yes, this is something we would love to do. Let me help you do it. That's like, that's incredible for a company like ours. And that's what, that's the kind of things that moves the industry forward. Because anywhere else, this would take, you know, two years or more. I mean, that's interesting, actually, Steve, because I think on the one hand, you're working with established institutions and banks and improving existing processes, which we all agree they're in desperate need of. You know, they're quite archaic and well-established institutions. Right, and they're also heterogeneous, which is the, the problem. So if you want to do things like have a standardized response code for confirmation of payment, like if you're a remittance company, your big issue is you never get positive confirmation that the money actually got to the other end. And, and if you wait like three or four days and then you get a return code that says, sorry, we couldn't deliver your, your funds. And so those things are really hard when you're dealing with all these heterogeneous systems. So yeah. you can solve. But on the flip side, when you talk about the ADGM, absolutely agree with you in terms of them being thought leaders in this space. But they're a newer regulator by way of comparison to, say, the FCA in London or the regulators in the US. And I wonder whether that works to their advantage as well. I mean, what's your thoughts on that? Oh, it's, um, I think it's really night and day in terms of, like for the FCA, they have this narrow window where they open up the sandbox so you can get feedback. And so if you're not in that window, you know, you have to wait months and months uh, for that to happen. Mm -hmm. Here you can, at ADGM, you can just go in and say, hey, here, here's my idea and get, get feedback immediately. Yeah. You know, and the, the, the responses just happen at much faster speed. Agreed. Thank so, you. so what you're saying, Steve, is that an old system, it takes ages to improve, but because the ADGM is a new regulator, they're quicker and faster. They can, they, they basically, the he's old, no he's going. the tip, the, the, <laughs> The typical regulator <laughs> operates using a very well-established protocol for how they do things. And the end result is that after two years, they get a regulation which, like, makes no sense. Like, there's some protective regulations that I'm, I'm not, you know. <laughs> But there are, there, but there, there are examples where, where, where there are regulations that were actually meant to protect people and they find out that it actually creates the reverse situation. Um, so for example, like you're required to tell people exactly what it will cost ahead of time uh, now on, a, on an FX transaction. And that was seen as that's going to create transparency for users. But the problem is that now the banks that do that have to estimate their charges. And so now they have to, to bring up the cost to over what, what, they, what the market is because they don't know what the costs are. So they overestimate, which means that the consumers get screwed because they pay a higher price. But that wasn't the intention. But it's things like this where there are unanticipated consequences because of the process that the typical regulator would use to create the regulation because they don't um, get the input from all the stakeholders that they should. So, so I'll speak to you. Um, I, I, I'm not picking on the Fed. I'm, 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 believe me, I'm not picking yes. on the Fed. I think the <laughs> Fed does a marvelous job. They do, they do take input. I'm talking about other regulators. <laughs> no, and seriously, right? I, Fed I, now I, stuff I work, is awesome. I work for the U.S. Treasury, not for the Fed. <laughs> it's, it's, it's great. Um, so, in, in terms of. Um, I will um, <laughs> give them their announcement. Um, all right. So in terms of um, uh, involving all of the stakeholders, I think um, I, I'd like to touch on the Financial Action Task Force that has um, involved um, most of the global community um, in terms of setting standards for activities um, in this space, so virtual asset service providers, um, and involved regulators all over the world in, in doing so. But uh, to back up just for a moment, um, the U.S. has been really at the forefront of regulating digital assets for quite some time. Um, and both our, um, our FIU, uh, our Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, FinCEN, and our Office of Foreign Asset Control, which is um, responsible for sanctions, have put out a lot of guidance and um, lots of advisories and tried to help the industry understand how do existing laws um, that we already have that apply to uh, financial institutions across the board um, who are transmitting value, how do those then more tactically apply to their business model? Because the laws are, are already there. 
Um, we just need to figure out how to implement them in the case of this technology. They don't simply change because there's a new technology. It's not okay so, um, to uh, not, you know, make sure that money laundering is not occurring um, in in uh, the new technology. So in um, in June this past year, um, under the leadership of the United States. Um, the Financial Action Task Force, or FATF, the global standard setting body for anti money laundering and countering the threat of finance um, or countering financial terrorism, um, worked together and voted together as regulators globally to essentially to do better uh, um, across the world to um, ensure that such standards are in place for virtual asset service providers. So um, this ensures that they um, are required to implement the same standards that a traditional financial institution would be required to implement, such as identifying who the funds um, that are being sent are being sent on behalf of and who's receiving them. Um, very, very kind of basic but critical important things to ensure that we're being responsible about how we use um, the new technology and how we continue to do some of the same activities, which is again, just a transfer of value. Now, while these standards are in place and the world came together to agree that that is necessary, um, those standards are only as effective as every jurisdiction then is able to implement them. So we can set standards, but if we have regulations on the books, it requires not only the regulations, but also the supervisory um, capacity to supervise against those regulations and the enforcement capacity to enforce against the supervision. So all three of those components are necessary across, um, across all jurisdictions. Now with these new standards, um, the United States has volunteered to be one of the first countries that is, um, is evaluated against the technical compliance of those standards. And that will um, happen very soon in our third year follow-up with the FATF. Um, and we look forward to seeing how, how we do. Um, and we encourage um, other jurisdictions and countries as they're working to implement these um, standards um, you know, to work with us as we are one of the first countries to undergo this and, and see how it goes. So um, we, uh, you know, we will certainly be working, working with our partner um, countries to ensure that these um, standards are put in place. And I think at the end of the day, um, the overriding con um, concern and goal of the U.S. Treasury is to make sure that the global financial system is not, um, you know, cannot be abused by illicit actors and to protect the integrity of what that system is. And, um, and so with that said, you know, these, these safeguards are, are important, but the potential capabilities of a technology like blockchain technology will never be realized if we can't, um, if, if we don't appropriately and in a robust manner, um, make sure that these standards are implemented. So I have an issue with <laughs> sanction screening, Surprising. for example. <laughs> and sanction screening, so I'm on the technical advisory board for HSBC, and they employ like 5,000 people just to do sanction screening on the transactions. Because, so even if it's five cents or one cent, you know, your micropayments, everything has to be sanction screened. And the problem is we don't have the technology to be able to do that automatically without generating a lot of false positives. And a human being may review something for 10 seconds, or it may take a minute, or they may have to get asked for more information. And what, the, what happens is that when you ask the guy who's, who's head of their global payments, the, he'll tell you that they spend like $100,000 to find like 10 cents. And I said, that makes no sense. He said, yeah, but there's no threshold. Like, you know, so you can stop, you can spend millions and millions of dollars and, and you know, just hit like 1% of the money laundering that happens. And you'll find that all this technology that you put in place and you, you spent all this money to do doesn't find the big, um, the big money laundering problems, which are all found, pretty much all found by whistleblowers. So we so, have this technology, we're spending a lot of money on it, but the cost benefit is just not there so, because people's legitimate payments are delayed. 
because so of that, sometimes I, I, for months, I will. I'll you leave a more full in. discussion of sanctions to another conversation to yeah. give these gentlemen a yeah, no, comment. Um, but one, just one brief comment as as an example, where um, a, a sum may seem small, but it has a significant impact. Um, earlier this year, um, you know, FinCEN was able to track via um, uh, via at least two different Bitcoin addresses receipt by Hamas of at least five thousand dollars. Um, so that that is something that certainly we wouldn't want to see. Now, five thousand dollars of a terrorist, um, you know, and going to a terrorist organization may seem small, may not seem like a lot of money, but we know that it costs very little to conduct a terror attack, and the impact, um, the cost to the individual um, that is attacked is, is, you can't put a price on that. So I'll, I'll leave that there and I'll Thank give you. the other. I don't know, Zishan, if you wanted to come in with. I, I, I'll start with a quick dig. Didn't HSBC get fined for big money laundering uh, ring yeah. in Mexico? So the controls, Mexico, the controls yeah. aren't working yeah, yeah. then. Huh? Huh? <laughs> the the, the anti-money laundering controls clearly aren't, aren't doing what they're supposed clearly, to do. Clearly not. Clearly they not. should have had, but, but as I said, some of these big operations, when you look at actually how they're caught, they're all caught by whistleblowers. <laughs> I, that's I was the, just, ne I was that's the next you. project. Um, so <laughs> in terms of challenges in the crypto space, I think one of our uh, biggest challenge has been the lack of regulation. Um, we tend to operate in a space where um, there's not a lot of clarity on what, as a crypto business, you can or can't do. And that makes it challenging to interact with the traditional financial system as well. And I, I actually, for one, am quite happy about you know, uh, having a standard global standardized framework for regulation because ultimately what I think that does is it, it creates a level of hygiene that, uh, a basic level of hygiene for the industry that gets the bad actors out. So I am very much, I, I think that's the single biggest way of moving the needle forward is to have a, um, is to know exactly where the line is. What, what I used to hire, when I hire compliance people, I, I often say to them, I said, you know, in traditional finance, you know where the line is, and then you decide how close to the line you want to be. Whereas in crypto, there was no line. You have to predict where you think the line is going to be and ensure you're on, that, on the right side of that hypothetical line. So if we're given clarity by global organizations like FATF on how to... Uh, manage risks and exposures we have within the crypto ecosystem, that certainly helps businesses like us. Um, and, and crypto generally go more mainstream. So I think that's probably the biggest challenge we have. And I think one of the things that we can be proud of here in the UAE is that we have, you know, the ADGM have got their crypto, crypto asset framework. And very recently this month, the Capital Markets Authority issued their draft paper as well. So it's all coming. Um, but I agree, harmonization on a broader scale is very helpful. Absolutely. Makes, Makes life difference. much easier for all and, of you. And yeah. taking advantage of that crypto um, uh, currency framework, what we are going to do is the same thing that's available in a number of markets around the world. As you know, today, banks, when they fund, they keep Nostra accounts with other institutions. And we estimate there is about 5 to $10 trillion that's stuck of depositors' money that's lying elsewhere around the world with capital risk, depreciation risk, and all the things that go with it. And that's the reason remittances are too expensive. But if you use cryptos to do just-in-time settlement and just-in-time funding, that 5 to $10 trillion come, come, can come back home, reducing the cost for financial institutions, which in turn can make remittances cheaper. Because otherwise, the World Bank goal of bringing down the cost of remittances from 8% from to a below sub-5 number would not be achievable. But with on-demand liquidity, that means using cryptos to fund it between two licensed exchanges is the best way to go. Wonderful, thank you. I'm afraid we've run out of time. What I was going to say, <laughs> half an hour wasn't enough and we could have spoken for another half an hour. Um, I very much enjoyed that, I hope you did too. And we're all available afterwards if you have any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.